Hi, everybody. Mitch Tannenbaum here. Thanks for joining me today. This is the Security News Update for January 15th, 2023. Uh, in the alerts department, uh, Windows 8 or 8.1, technically, is officially dead. Um, it should have been dead a long time ago, but it's actually officially dead at this point. So, uh, you know, if you're running Windows 8 or 8.1 and you need to continue to run it for whatever reason, then you need to put compensating controls in place because you are not going to see any more patches ever again. Uh, and we're even seeing the browser makers are not even fixing holes in the browser. So you're really going to be kind of on your own at that point. And I really recommend upgrading to Windows 10 or Windows 11. Um, next in the reference department, um, uh, a lot of folks use managed service providers uh, for a variety of different reasons. And uh, if you do, um, understand that they likely have the keys to your digital universe. <clears throat> Excuse me, Anne. And, um, you know, you really need to do a good job of vetting them to understand, uh, first of all, between you and them, what the divvy up is of the tasks. And then make sure that they really have their security act together. Um, uh, in this direction, and this, this, by the way, includes your cloud universe. For a lot of folks, the MSP is also managing the cloud universe. And in, and in some cases, uh, clients don't even have the credentials to their own devices or their own services. So um, the UK's National Cybersecurity Center, called the NCSC, has put out some guidelines on how that relationship should be managed, which are good. Um, they're a good start, at least. This is joining them to get the word out. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you need help uh, vetting a uh, managed service provider or a cloud service provider, you know, any cloud service provider, um, you know, we have a whole methodology for doing that. So uh, feel free to reach out to us and, and we will uh, be happy to help you with that. Um, in the software and hardware department, uh, Intel added uh, the fourth generation Xeon product line that ju just came out. Uh, in fact, I think today, actually. It came out, and um, there's uh, a couple of interesting features in it. Xeon's is their server uh, product line. Uh, first one is hardware-level virtual machine isolation, which apparently requires help from the hosting provider because um, it works in Google Cloud and Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud, and Alibaba, the China cloud, and IBM, but uh, not yet in AWS. Um, the other thing... Um, they, they added on the Xeon uh, chips is what's called flow control. Uh, that existed on the Intel Core chips for a year or so now. It creates a shadow stack, which um, basically uh, nullifies a certain class of attack called uh, return-oriented programming, uh, where the uh, hackers modify the stack to go off and do things it's not supposed to do. And... Um, uh, this basically kills off that whole class of attacks. Um, so while the chip came out uh, on the 15th, it's probably going to be a couple of months before um, server makers have that released. But <clears throat> it's probably a good thing to consider uh, in your cloud world if the, the cloud provider um, offers uh, fourth generation Xeon servers, that would be probably a good thing. Um, in the important issues department, uh, and I also did a video on this as well on the video blog site, but, um, you know, we we saw um, the airlines kind of go sideways over the Christmas holidays, um, and most of the airlines recovered pretty quickly, with the exception of Southwest. And the reason why Southwest did not recover was that they had a, a huge amount of technical debt, which are, you know, technical things that you know you need to do, but for whatever reason you're choosing not to do it. In the case of Southwest, is because they were spending billions of dollars buying back stock to keep the investors happy. Uh, but at the end of that is going to cost them, you know, well over a billion dollars. And in particular, it's going to cost them customer loyalty. There's a lot of folks who are just not going to trust Southwest anymore, and they're going to fly on uh, anybody but Southwest. Um, in the legislative and legal department. Uh, the Supreme Court has told NSO, the folks that make the Pegasus spyware, uh, that they are not immune from lawsuits. They claim that because they sold to governments, 
and governments have sovereign immunity, there was some sort of transitive property, which meant that the NSO group had sovereign immunity. And the Supreme Court says, no, we don't really think that's the case. Uh, so that's going to go to trial now. Um, of course, you know, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. But still, uh, you know, NSO has been trying to get this thing shot down over and over again. So they didn't have to do it. And, and mostly because it's going to be really embarrassing, you know, what will likely uh, come out at trial. Uh, in the ongoing saga in Russia, uh, Russia has decided to legalize pirated movie screenings. Now, you know, the reality is this is probably no different than uh, it's it's always been. Uh, they had, uh, uh, in their world, they had something they called pre-screenings, which was their version of showing pirated movies in a movie theater. But now, Putin is just going off and, and uh, being very blatant about it and saying that, you know, U.S. content, uh, you, you're illegally allowed to pirate it and, and show it in the movie theater. So, um, you know, this won't have much of an effect on the revenue of U.S. companies. That just makes uh, Putin just uh, a little bit more of a pariah in the rest of the world. Uh, next, uh, also on a legal front, Apple is facing a potential import ban on their current generation watches, the ones that have a pulse oximeter uh, sensor in it. Uh, apparently, that sensor uh, is patented by uh, another company, Massimo. And um, and Massimo says that this is not the first time that Apple has violated patents. Um, so now, at this point, obviously, Apple is going to go off and try to get that decision reversed. But in the meantime, the International Trade Commission is going to vote on a ban of importing those Apple watches. I am not exactly sure. I, I guess... Apple could go off and create a watch that doesn't have that pulse oximeter in it. Um, but I don't know how easy that would be. I, uh, I assume that just disabling it is probably not going to be enough for the courts, but, but I don't know. Um, and lastly, in the um, legal department, General Nakasone, the head of uh, Cyber Command in the, in the National Security Agency, um, is has been lobbying for... Uh, the renewal of the parts of the FISA Act that go away at the end of 2023, those parts being um, the, um, uh, let's see, the, uh, uh, the, the ability for the government to obtain business records, uh, the lone wolf surveillance provision, which says that you don't have to be a, uh, a big um, terrorist group in order for them to be able to surveil you, and roving wiretaps, which says that if you you change phones the, and they had a wiretap on your old phone, uh, they automatically get a wiretap on your new phone. Um, you know, the problem is the FBI got caught lying to the, the FISA court. The, the FISA court basically is is a bit of a j joke, in my opinion, because um, there's no oversight, right? You got a bunch of judges who know very little bit about technology because they're, you know, old people and, and not technologists. Um, the people who are the subject of the FISA court orders don't know about them because they're classified. For the most part, the court orders never see the light of day except maybe five years after the fact, maybe, possibly. Um, and, you know, the judges have to trust the FBI agents or whoever brings a request for a FISA court order to them that they're telling the truth, which they haven't done. What that means is that uh, neither the Republicans nor the Democrats trust um the FISA court. And, you know, I think that, you know, some oversight, some change in how that works is probably a, a good thing um, because it's clear that uh, it, it, there's just not a sufficient, sufficient amount of oversight there. So we sh we shall see what happens with that, but that, that will expire at the end of this year if uh, Congress does not renew it. Um, in the breaches department, <laughs> uh, the uh, UK's Royal Mail uh, said that they're experiencing a uh, severe service disruption. Uh, what does that mean? They haven't said, uh, but uh, apparently this is a ransomware attack, uh, according to one of the ransomware groups, Lockbit Group. Um, and they said, um, uh, don't try to send international mail. Um, uh, they haven't said exactly what will happen if you try. Uh, maybe they won't accept it at the post office. Um, but more than likely, it'll just sit there in a pile until they get this sorted out. They also said 
the stuff that you have um, already sent may be subject to delay. Um, now, the maybe I think probably is if the uh, piece of, of mail was processed before the cyber attack, then you're probably okay, assuming it's gotten outside of Britain by that time. Um, you know, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, you know, they're investigating supposedly and they've reported the situation to regulators. Um, but they're not really giving us a lot of information. Um, you know, and that could be fueled by the lawyers, of course. Uh, it also could be fueled by the fact that they don't really know what the hell is going on, which wouldn't be very impressive, but would probably be typical. Um, Remember, they're a uh, Financial Times 250 company, so they're a big organization. They had revenues last year, $15 billion. Uh, and still, you know, they're they're just being very opaque about what's going on here. Uh, next in the attack world, uh, a combination of the AFLAC cancer policy policyholders and Zurich auto policy policyholders. I'm not sure exactly. Oh, I, I think I know what's going on. They, they both shared the same third-party vendor. And that third-party vendor got hacked. Um, they're not uh, disclosing who that vendor is yet, but that will come out soon enough. Um, total of four million policies between the two of them. Um, uh, the data is already available on the dark web, um, and of course, you know, companies are not going to care that Zurich and and Aflac decided to outsource this to this company got hacked, uh, and they're going to sue Aflac and Zurich, and that's what would happen to you if you went off and outsourced something to a third party and that third party had a uh, a breach. So, you know, one more time, we're seeing this week after week after week. Um, you know, third party risk is a real problem these days. Um, uh, and, and lastly, in the breach department, um, we have uh, the San Francisco Transit Police, the folks that police the Bay Area Rapid Transit or BART, um, <clears throat> seem to have lost about 120,000 files uh, to hackers. Um, this includes unredacted files detailing suspected child abuse, uh, mental health records, and other personally identifiable information. Not great for BART. Um, you know, I think the side effect of this, you know, because it's kind of hard to sue the San Francisco government, you can't do it, but it's hard, uh, is that people just won't report things or they won't give, they won't reveal details or um, you know, if the cops come to them and ask them for information, they'll say, I didn't see anything. I don't remember anything because uh, they just don't trust the government's ability to keep anything secret. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's a that's a, a valid concern. You know, if you give out information uh, to a government entity because you're you're legally required to, uh, you know, you want to have some degree of confidence that that information will remain confidential. And, you know, time and time again, we're seeing that that's not the case. Speaking of uh, data being confidential, um, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a problem giving your data to to um, Experian. Uh, the first problem, of course, is that since you're not the customer, you don't have any control over what data they get. And the second problem is they don't seem to be able to control what they have. So uh, that's a big problem, of course. You know, Experian has breach after breach after breach after breach. Um, so, you know, it says something about what they're not doing from their cybersecurity program. Uh, and, uh, you know, this one is, is another self-inflicted breach. They had a bug on their website in terms of, of how you request your credit report, which allowed you to go off and bypass all the security. Um, and it was just a matter of doing a little uh, playing around with the address bar uh, and you were good to go. You could go pull anybody's um, credit report as long as you knew their social security number. I think it's all you needed. Um, last time I looked, that website was down. Uh, so I am guessing that they have just taken it offline at this point to try to mitigate the risk. I am sure there will be lawsuits to follow. Uh, but at this point, um, you know, the problem you have, I mean, you can choose, it may not be easy, but you can choose not to do business with Amazon or Facebook or pick your, pick your company, right? You can't choose not to do business with Experian because you're not the customer, um, which I think doesn't help them from a lawsuit perspective. I think, I think in fact, it hurts them because people are going to say, well, there isn't anything I could do to mitigate this nonsense. Um, and I, and I don't know what, 
experience defensive that would be. So, um, uh, I guess, you know, don't spend money, uh, you know, so we shall see where that goes, but I am sure that, uh, there will be lawsuits out of this. Um, uh, rack space, um, has an interesting conundrum, one of many, but, uh, this one in particular, uh, is, is related to the exchange server attack. Uh, we're now finding out this quote zero day that they were bandying about, uh, I think was actually, uh, they decided not to patch their exchange servers because they were worried about collateral damage from the patch. Uh, and so they did some mitigation efforts, which Microsoft said should work. But what we've seen on time and time again on these mitigation efforts, and even a lot of times in patches, is that these things uh, uh, protect against the symptoms and not the root cause. And I suspect that's what happened here with this particular mitigation effort. It did not protect against the root cause and hackers figured out how to bypass the mitigation efforts. And the result of that, of course, is, um, you know, all these people, you know, tens of thousands of, of customers, um, lost access to their email. Uh, the side effect of this is a couple of things. First of all, um, you know, this is going to cost them tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars and lawsuits and all kinds of things, right? So you got all that. Um, and then they've decided to go shut down their exchange business, which was generating about $30 million a year in revenue. So, you know, right there, you lose $30 million a year in revenue <clears throat> forever, in addition to all the, the uh, mitigation efforts you got to make. So, and, and I think there's going to be companies who are going to go off and say, uh, Rackspace, you know, let me let me see who's out there besides Rackspace that we might be able to use because, you know, they had this problem. And I don't know what the details are, but I'd rather, you know, deal with somebody that didn't have this problem. Um, next, um, we're seeing uh, our friends at uh, uh, Chat uh, GBT, the AI bot, um, which is really cool technology, uh, is being used for malicious purposes. This should not surprise anybody. Uh, hackers are uh, uh, lazy, if nothing else. And if they can go get the chat bot to go write code for them or write um, uh, ransomware messages for them in perfect English, in a style of your choice, um, why wouldn't they do that? Uh, so we're seeing that being used. Uh, and, and the other thing they're using it for is for the more senior um programmers to be able to go hand off stuff to more junior people and let let them leverage the chat bot to go off and do some of the stuff that the more senior folks so that that puts more people available in the uh hacker community uh doing stuff and the net effect of that probably will be more tax over time so you know no good deed goes unpunished the chat gbt is is a nice technology but it's certainly being misused um, and it didn't take very long. You know, it just came out in November. Um, uh, and then lastly, in the security news bites, um, the, you know, California came out last year with digital license plates. They thought that was cool. There's a line on the bottom where you can put a message of your choice. Of course, they outsourced that to the lowest bidder and that bidder got hacked. Gee, there's a surprise. Um, you know, uh, I have not seen any uh, four letter words on license plates in California yet. But you know that is coming. Um, next, the AICPA, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, uh, which is the owner of the SOC 2 uh, so-called security certification, uh, was hacked. And the personal information of 140,000 members uh, is now available on the dark web. Um, I, I wonder if uh, we could look at the AICPA SOC 2 report and see what it says in there. Um, uh, next, uh, Norton LifeLock uh, warns about a, a potential password manager account compromise. This is a little bit different than what we saw at LastPass. What they're saying happened here is that if users uh, reuse passwords, which is you know not a great thing to do in general and really, really, really a bad thing to do when it comes to things like password managers, uh, it looks like the hackers were using credential stuffing accounts against the Norton LifeLock uh, web uh, user ID. And if users use the same or very similar passwords 
uh, on the website as they did in their password vault, then and they reuse that from another site. Well, I mean, you can't particularly blame Norton for that, but nonetheless, they're going to get tarred with that brush. Uh, so the moral of the story here, use complex passwords, use multi-factor authentication, and do not reuse passwords, even between things like Norton's website and their password vault. Um, next, um, Germany's cartel watchdog is not very happy with Google. Um, and uh, that's not good for Google because Germany has got amongst the strongest privacy laws uh, in the EU. So we shall see what happens with e with Google. But I don't think that they'll fare well. I think they will wind up spending money. Um, and uh, a, a new Asian e-commerce hacking group is netting billions and billions of dollars from fraud. Um, so, you know, uh, life goes on. And not a lot of change, unfortunately. Um, you know, and as we saw in just in this uh, newsletter, you know, two or three uh, vendor data breaches. So, uh, you know, if you need help with your uh, vendor risk management program, uh, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to help you. And until next time, uh, stay safe. Thanks for listening. Turnkey Cybersecurity and Privacy Solutions offers the complete cybersecurity program for small to medium-sized businesses. They include everything needed to secure your business and meet compliance requirements. Visit our website at turnkeycybersecurityandprivacysolutions.com to learn more.